Good afternoon. Well, it is high time that I uh, um, went back to my History of England broadcast and podcast, broadcast, broadcast. And, uh, you know, today we're going to be talking about how England became one country, united under one king. But before we do, I think it's important to know what it meant to be a king in those days. See, the king in the Middle Ages in England represented the country in a physical and spiritual manner. He embodied the country in its coinage and its judicial position, process, as well as its land tenure and its religious life. It is said that a yard was measured only by taking the measurement of the distance from the tip of the nose of the king to the end of his outstretched thumb. The history of England is, is a history of its kings and queens in reality, for the health of the king affected the health of the kingdom, and its private vices could provoke public calamities. It was felt. The kings had the power to do what they wanted, and really, who they wanted. They tended to be violent people, yet they represented God on earth, for the English people were God's people on earth. Now, it's believed that God elected the king and blessed him, occasionally her, with the Holy Spirit. The king appointed leading clergy, controlled the monasteries in England, the main task of the king was to lead his troops in battle. The king owned all the land, all the highways, all the bridges, all the monasteries, all the churches, all the towns and the rivers, all the markets and fairs. The voice of the king was the voice of law. The king even had the power to touch people and cure skin diseases, something, something that was done from the time of Edward the Confessor right up to Queen Anne in 1712, when it was decided, okay, this is a little bit too much. The last time we talked about how England had become three large kingdoms with a number of smaller kingdoms around them, and the bigger kingdoms were complex administrative states with high taxes that allowed them to build communal enterprises and keep a common currency in circulation. And we talked about how the Vikings came, and the three kingdoms ended up united in a common cause to fight them off, but eventually the Vikings ended up getting the upper hand and taking over much of England. And we talked about why the Vikings came, revenge, land, slaves, wives. And eventually they stopped simply attacking and came to settle. Which ended up with them controlling a large part of England, known as the Dane Law. And they would have taken all of England were it not for Alfred the Great, who managed to beat them back after several defeats. And the Vikings ended up establishing, as I said, Dane Law. And I talked about how Dane Law was administered and how Alfred and his successors borrowed from this idea but how the successors of Alfred eventually managed to take back much of England. And finally, we, we kind of talked about how England was, at the end of the first millennium, a land of mostly royal states, with many people in England working on them as serfs or as slaves, and how the towns were starting to become a somewhat major part of English society, although the age had not yet come. By the end of the 10th century, England was rich and prosperous, the Vikings, they still came, they searched for plunder and slaves, but now they are fighting their own relatives and the English. During the 980s, there was still sporadic raiding, and London was burned down in the first of its many great fires. In 991, a Danish army won the victory at Essex in the Battle of Maldon. The current king, Ethelred the Unready, was forced to sue for peace. And by the way, his parents didn't name him Ethelred the Unready. That would be kind of silly. He was given that name when he was basically declared to be unready. But anyway, the Vikings asked some money. Ethelred brought them off for 22,000 pounds of silver and gold. And the talks were helped along by the fact that Ethelred could speak Old Norse. Remember, these were people who were from Danish backgrounds. Anglo-Saxons were from the same family. Now, to pay the Danish tax, or the Dane Guild, the English had to bring back the old taxation system. Now, that system had been used by Alfred to great effect. But Ethelred was not Alfred. He was not liked by many of his kingdom. They thought he was receiving bad counsel. The leaders of the realm were the earls, who controlled the shires. And they had all these different opinions on how to fight the Vikings, but... Ethelred didn't listen to them. Now, Ethelred was a good king when he came to legal and administrative affairs, 
And he was a king of poetry and king of music. But he was not a king of war, and that is how people were defined in those days. In 994, the Vikings came back to England and again laid siege to London. Again, Ethelred tried to bribe his way out of the trouble he found himself in. The Vikings paid attention to this. The next year is whenever they needed money. Off to England! Let's go on a raiding! In fact, one of the only good things that Ethelred did on the throne was in 1002, he made Emma of Normandy, the sister of the current Duke of Normandy, Richard II Le Bon, or the Good. Now this come back either haunt England or help it out in the coming years. We'll talk about that. The problem with the Vikings was not, they weren't going away. They came back, and they came back, and they came back, and back, and they hit England again and again with violence. They burned the monasteries, they burned the towns. The same year that Ethelred married Emma, Ethelred decided, I'm attacking fire of fire. He ordered all days of England massacred in retaliation. But that's not helpful. The Vikings kept coming in anyway. And they were angry. More angry than they'd been before. And this time, no money. No money. We don't care. We want blood. In 1013, the king of Denmark was a man named Swund Thusig. We would say Swen Forkbeard. I'm trying to pronounce it Danish here. I'm not Danish. I'm American. Sorry. But anyway, Swen, he deemed England was his for the picking. The Shires were in this array. The leaders didn't have a common strategy that worked. Ethred sometimes tried to pay the Vikings off. Sometimes he went to battle, only lose. Lawlessness was high in England. Theft, murder, rape, followed close by the natural disasters of pestilence and disease and general hatred of every man for his brother. The poor said that this is the punishment of God on the land, the luxury of nobles. So Swen sailed to England with his son Canute in a large fleet. Note to self, Canute is a good name for a dog. Anyway, Canute. Now the chroniclers state that their fleet was splendid with the ships ornamented with gold and silver, the shields bright and shiny, and when the eye fell on them, they were dazzled. Some admired this evasion force, some dreaded it, and all those left of Dane law submitted at once, and Ethelred fled for protection to the walls of London, then fled the country for Normandy. And Swen said, well, no King England, I'm King of England now. But he only ruled for five weeks, and then died. On his deathbed, he divided his kingdom between his two sons. His eldest son, Harold, was made king of Denmark. His youngest son, Canute, was made king of England. But then Ethelred came back to fight for his kingdom. And when he died, the citizens of London elected his son, Edmund Ironside, as a new king. And Edmund fought Canute to a bloody standoff. And though he lost, Canute agreed to divide England between them. Knut took all of England, north of the Thames. Everything south of the Thames and London was given Edmund. It's a nice gift. But it wasn't the last, because only a few months later, Edmund was dead. And Knut now became king of England entirely. And a few years, years later, Knut's brother, Harold, died. And Knut took the throne of Denmark. But this is a story of England, not a story of Denmark. That's just a side note. File the way next time you're in Jeopardy. Anyway, what did. Sorry. Now, did this. Is... Alfred the Great's family was rather great for its time, but it was gone. And this new royal family, Knut, was at least at first extremely bloody. Knut had executed all the great nobles of England along with the children, in order that his own sons could keep the kingdom he had just conquered. Whenever he took hostages, he would have them mutilated and then released. He was cunning and cruel, but he was a politician. After he converted to Christianity, he not only made sure to give lots of money to the English church, but whenever he entered the church or a monastery, he'd walk with his eyes down in a humble act of obedience that was seen by all. But that was because he knew if he had the church on his side, his rule would be stronger. Now, Knut had already made the first step to make his rule legitimate. He married Emma of Normandy. Remember, she married Ethelred. Ethelred's dead. She's still around. Now she's married Knut. 
But his new country of England was weak. It had been years of war, years of raids, and it needed peace. So Canute found that by calling for 82,000 pounds to be taxed in various shires, he could pay off his army and let them retire. And then he started to set England in order. First, he divided the country into four military districts, and then those men who had served him in the invasion, they were paid off, given the shires in place of the English things. The English were subjected to race once again. Now, Canute also claimed to rule over Scotland, Ireland, and Wales, as well as Denmark and Nor Norway, another new Viking empire. And he then married his daughter, Gunhilda, to Henry III, the newly crowned Holy Roman Emperor. All of that was because he wanted peace. He wanted to be known as a great man, and when he died, he was known as Canute the Great. But greatness ends, and he did die in 1035. His bones are buried at Winchester Cathedral. Now, he had a son. He wanted his son, Harkonude, to rule the empire in his place. But Harkonude had to deal with rebellion in Denmark. So he left England in the control of his half-brother, brother, Harold Herfa, who agreed, after finding out that he could not become king in his own right, to ruling over half of England. Again, the half his father originally owned, everything north of the River Thames. And Harold bribed the nobles in his region to crown him king of England in the place of his half-brother, and he built up an army that would keep his half-brother, Hardcanude, far from the shores of England. In the spring of 1040, Harold heard that Harkonude had an army and was coming to invade, and Harold was so anxious that he died of unknown causes. Now, he was buried at Westminster Abbey, but as soon as Harkonude had taken the throne, he had Harold's body dug up, beheaded, and thrown into Thames as punishment. And Harkonude now took the English name Hathacanute, which is pretty much what he was, half of what his father had been. But his rule didn't last long. He was dying of tuberculosis. So he invited his half-brother, Edward, to come to England. I'm sorry, there's a lot of half-brothers and everything. It's kind of like a British soap opera. Follow along, people. So he invited his half-brother, Edward, to come to England from Normandy. And he then said, you're my heir. And then he died of a stroke at a wedding. Died of a stroke. Yeah. Anyway. The new king, Edward, was part English, part Norman, related to Alfred the Great and the Vikings, so he's the best of both worlds. But his real love is Normandy. He lived there for 28 years when he came back to England. He arrived in England, London with a Norman escort. His first orders were to give three Norman, Norman clerics English bishop, bishop, yeah, bishopics. He granted to the Normans the Sussex ports, gave them to Fecamp Abbey in Normandy. He gave the merchants of Rowan their own London port at Dalgate. The invasion of England by the Normans began in 1040, not 1066. Now, not everyone loved Edward, especially in England. One of the early missteps that Edward made was when the monks of Canterbury elected as a new archbishop a cousin of Goodwin, the Earl of Wessex, related to the Danish royal family through his marriage to a Danish nobleman. And Edward rejected this appointment. He appointed one of his Norman clerics, who he knew and trusted. Now Goodwin swore, I will get revenge, and you met with one of his friends, Leofric, the Earl of Mercia, who was married to the famous Lady Godiva. Now, though this revenge scheme went nowhere, it's important to note that Lady Godiva would go on to some fame. She agreed to ride through the marketplace to Coventry stark naked and return her husband, Leofric, would dismiss all the taxes for Coventry. And she ordered all the houses to have the windows closed and covered so she'd be heard but not seen. There was one man named Tom who did look out, however, and since then the term Peeping Tom has entered the English language. The story's not true, but still makes her a great story and even greater line of candy. Anyway, the reason Goodwin did not succeed in his quest for revenge is that while the earls of England hated the Normans, they hated war and disorder more, they feared that if Edward was taken down, the door would be opened once again 
the Civil War, once again to a Viking invasion, once again to another Viking king, and they had enough of that. So Goodwin was forced to flee. But he had a son. His son, Harold, would come back to our story later. Now, we don't know much about Edward the Confessor. The Chroniclers did not write much about him. He didn't do much to impress himself on English life. We know that since he survived as king for 24 years in a ruthless and violent society, he must have been shrewd and ruthless as well. We know he is known as Edward the Confessor because he was deemed to have been a witness to the Christian faith, but in life he was not particularly pious. Now, he did marry Edith of Wessex in 1045 when she was about 20, so she could have been as young as 12 and as old as 25, but that, you know, that's his wife. But he had taken the vow of chastity. He died a virgin. He was a merciful man, but not devout, in fact, except for that vow of chastity. And after Goodwin raised the flag of rebellion against him, Edward punished his wife Edith by sending her to a nunnery since she's Goodwin's sister. Now he may have wanted to divorce her, but this was a step too far. He would bring Edith back to court, but not to his bed. Now he made the usual grants to the monasteries, but he wasn't a great diplomat, he wasn't a great administrator. He had no grand plan except to survive on the throne as long as he could. And he did, until January 5th, 1066, when he died. But now there's a problem. Who would get his throne? Now the rightful heir was Edgar Etheling, but he's only 14. That's going to be a problem. As he lay dying, Edward said the crown would go to his brother-in-law, Harold Goodwinson, the son of Goodwin, who had given him so much trouble. Now at the same time, William the Bastard, who had risen to become Duke of Normandy, stated that before he died. Edward had called both him and Harold into a room, told him that he was appointed William the next king, that Harold had sworn in holy relics to obey this royal whim. Now, history is written by the victors. So that's the account the school children have been told from th centuries. But it's most likely a lie. In any event, Harold acted like he is the rightful king, even though he was not part of any royal dysentery. Dysentery. Dynasty. Sorry, I'm trying to pronounce English origin. Anyway, he was the senior senior Earl of England. He was Earl of East Anglia and Earl of Wessex. He had huge estates and a fortune to go along with it. He's also brother-in-law to King Edward. He'd been trained by Edward for years as if he was going to be the new king. He was a brave man, skilled in war. He'd helped conquer Wales in 1063. So when Edward the Confessor died, he quickly arranged for the funeral and then walked to Westminster Abbey, had himself crowned, the first king crowned in the Abbey, but by no means the last. But there were threats to his kingdom, and he had to deal with them. He wanted a long, peaceful reign. The Scandinavian kings, led by King Harold Sig Sigurdsson, wanted to reclaim England to the Vikings. And there's also William, Duke of Normandy, saying, I have been cheated. I have been humiliated. And so much agitated that he cannot sit still and rage, mad of greed and desire for power. Now, William, as I mentioned, was a bastard. I like saying that. William was a bastard. William was a bastard. William was a bastard. Anyway, William, the bastard, was the illegitimate child of Robert I, Duke of Normandy, and his liaison with the daughter of a tanner. A child of violence, a child of adversity. He became Duke of Normandy when his father died. He was only eight years old. He came to power in a region that was noted for pride feuds and vendettas and ensuring public disorder, but he slowly, slowly subdued his enemies, winning his first victory on the battlefield when he was 19 and basically making the regions of Maine and Brittany, neighboring regions, his feudal dependence. He had power and he was ruthless. He was greedy for land, greedy for money. But he was able to bend man to follow. They refused. He made it his goal to break them. Now, because of this streak, he was able to make Normandy his own image. Normandy was still essentially a Norse state. Begun in the early 10th century, Vikings forced their way into the territory and settled down. 
The Normans were part of a warrior caste. They are more like the Vikings in English when it comes down to it, really. But they are masters in art of war, and Duke William uses mastery to form, form a civilized state, a centralized state that he led. Now, what we know about William the Bastard is that he was about 5 foot 10 inches. Skinny as a young man, but fatter as he got older. He had a harsh, rough voice, per the chroniclers. He's extremely strong, and for fun, he often sit on horseback and bend bows. The others could not bend even when they were on foot. Now, Harold fe feared William. You know, William's only claim to the throne of England was if he could take it by conquest, which is what William set out to do. It was an extremely hard endeavor, however, as the Normans did not have a fleet, and thus the ships for the invasion, more than 500 ships, had to be built from scratch. Now, William also faced a wealthy and powerful enemy, who had the ability to raise more soldiers than William could even imagine. But the Duke was willing to try this evasion, as he told the Lords of Normandy and the French King, he managed to sweet talk most everyone he could to follow him across the English Channel. He promised if they did help him, now they become richer than Midas. The English countryside is extremely fruitful. And he got the Bishop of Rome to give his blessing, stating that Harold had violated a sacred oath made in relics. He received not only the blessing, but a ring that contained the hair of St. Peter. Along with all the nails, enough nails to shoot up your horse in Normandy. But anyway, William also placed his daughter Cecilia in a nunnery in Cain, sacrificing his daughter to God in hopes of victory. And by mid-June, William had assembled 14,000 men to meet him at the channel port of Diva sur Mer. The Herald was aware of what William was planning. And he put the English Navy at the Isle of Wight. And he put his troops along the English Channel coast. The bad weather kept the invaders in port. And when they finally got a chance to get out of the port, they were blown off course. They landed at the port of St. Valerie sur Somme, where they were forced to stay until late September. It seemed that God was really not on the side of William after all. And the Herald waited for William to come. For four months he waited. And then on September 8th, he figured, well, William's not coming. The channel is pretty much impossible to cross after September 15th, so he sends the army home. He was running out of supplies. The harvest was at hand. His men were needed to go home and bring the harvest in. And so Harold sent his army home, and he went back to London. But then he learned that King Harold Sigerson was heading for York. And before Harold could summon his man again, the Vikings captured York. And Harold gathered what man he could, and on September 20th, marched north quickly, surprising the Danish, who had not expected to meet him just quite yet. On September 25th, the two kings met at Stamford Bridge, and King Harold of England won a complete victory. He killed King Harold Sigerson and ended one threat to his kingdom. But his luck was about to change, for as he was celebrating this victory, he received news that William had actually launched his invasion fleet and then landed at Pevensey. Bay at 9 o'clock in the morning, September 28, 1066. The most faithful day in English history. Normans moved quickly to Hastings, which is a better terrain, and here William built a makeshift castle and then ravaged the countryside. But he refused to march to London. He figured he'd stay on the defense for the winter and then go. Now, King Harold moved south with most of his army in Sussex. He acted quickly, but he forgot that most of his army had just fought a huge battle. The numbers were reduced. Now, maybe he was hoping to catch the Normans by surprise. He had just caught the Danish by surprise. He could do it again, right? He knew, the, he knew the territory well. He was born in Sussex. He had a large estate there. By October 13th, he reached, he reached Cardbeck Hill. He sent word to Sus Sussex militia, join me here. But while he waited, William moved taking a battle order on the southern slope of the hill in an in, in inferior position. The English had the superior position, but they were not organized. The English had about 7,000 men. The Normans had a bigger army. The English were on fort. The Normans were also on foot, but they had a large cavalry force waiting in the wings. And so the Battle of Hastings takes place on October 14th. Both sides believing that God is on their side. And at first, the English got the better of the Normans. The Normans kept coming and coming and coming. 
they threw themselves on the wall of the shields, and then, tired of this, they pretended to flee. And the English chased them, and then the Normans wheeled around and cut them off. And they liked it so much, they did it again, and the English again fell for it. But anyway, the English, majority of the English, however, held the ground, fighting the whole day. It was only as dusk fell that King Harold was shot in the eye by a straight arrow, and the soldiers fled into the night. The victory was William's. If only Harold had lived, the English would have won. Maybe, perhaps. But if only is a word, phrase that historians try not to use too much. Except when we get drunk. Anyway, William rested his army for five days, and then he marched to London. He hit Dover and Canterbury on the way. He had foes surrounding him. Man did not want him in England, despite the king being dead. The earls, earls of the north were against him. The city of London was against him. William was defeated trying to cross London Bridge, so he went on the offense of used terror to achieve his objectives. He burned southward to the ground. He lit a circle of fire all around London. He attacked the countryside, Hampshire, Surrey, Berkshire, laid to waste. It was years before they recovered. And finally, the English leaders trapped in London and agreed to submit. And William had won. It wasn't a major victory. It wasn't the first one that saw a foreign king conquer the English. After all, the English had dealt with the Romans, and it dealt with the Anglo-Saxons, and it dealt with the Vikings. William was just a long line of conquerors. Surrender was preferable to resistance. If they resisted, more blood would flow, and they had no leader. So William marched his troops in victory into London and was crowned King of England on Christmas Day at Westminster Abbey. As Duke of Normandy, however, he was still in theory a vassal of the French king, and thus his due status, dual status would bear bitter fruit for centuries. But we'll talk about that by and by. For now, I want to leave you with William, King of England, William I. Conqueror, King of England. And next time we're going to talk about William's reign and we're going to talk about the reign of his two sons. So stay tuned, my friends. Stay tuned.